How about going to a concert and running into somebody? You're like, wait a minute, you're here, I'm here. We both like the same band. I've had that band, happen. I've had you know? that happen to me before. Um, we, uh, yeah, exactly. I've had that happen. And, and, and you're like, wait a minute, that's so cool. Yeah. I don't know if you like these guys. Oh, yeah, Ellie Guns, man. And then They're this. my favorite. Yeah, and then you start chatting it up. Next thing you're, you know, besties. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty awesome stuff. So real quick plug for Audio Mover, company that pays a lot of bills around here, Audio Mover. So if you have old audio videotapes that you need to convert to digital, audiomover.com that's where you can go to get started and yeah anyway so let's get started so dylan is with us here today he's running the cameras running audio and Thank you, we're going to have him yes dylan's actually worked here at the studio for three years we're at the thick and mystic studio in saint george utah he's been a he's been a staple here for quite a while so he's given us a hand today and he's picking the first record so What's coming in? I know what this is. This is oh my gosh! This is one of my, one of my favorites. Are you familiar with this album? I am a little bit. Uh, a couple good songs that I do remember. I mean, I know more about the band than just uh, and now. I, I say so. I say Rick that. Nielsen, Bun E. Carlos. I can't think his. Uh, I'll get it in a second. I don't want to look because I know his name. Him, I won't know. I won't get his name. He, this guy though, was one of the coolest front men. He just looks cool. His voice. He's actually got this kind of a huge voice. Yeah. I mean, it's it's actually a really really big voice, and he's so. And he was just this. It's kind of an interesting band because Rick Nielsen was kind of the genius behind this group, and this guy had this reputation for being this rock solid drummer. You know, and he would sit and play and have that cigarette hanging out of his mouth, right. and he just had that simple drum set. And anyway, but he was apparently just this, like, metronome as far as players go. And then, he, but he was the one that that was the the brains behind the group. And he put this interesting thing together because he picked this really really good looking blonde guy right. to head the band, and and then just created this solid outfit. Anyway, there are these guys. You know, they they really, and I don't know their history as well as I probably should. But the "I Want You to Want Me." Yeah, that's on this, right? No, no, no. That was on uh, a no? previous album. That was actually several albums before this. But that was the one really. Okay. That I think that was the one that really broke them. Sure. But what was interesting is the one that that it broke them, but it wasn't the studio version that broke them. It was their live. Yeah, at the Budokan. live one's the one you always hear on the radio. Yes, which is interesting because I actually going back and listening to it, I love the studio version. Yes. But if you listen to it, it's very poppy, bubblegum sounding. Right. And the the live one is way more intense. Right. But yeah, but on the radio, you'd never hear the studio version. Never hear the studio. It was that, always that's the, one of those weird. Uh, I think Peter Frampton has another. That's, they always play the live version, mm-hmm. and and Kiss too, on a live they always play a rock and roll night. They yep. never play the studio version. It's that always that live version. And that's the one that broke them too. That broke Kiss uh, was that was that live al- was alive the album alive, and and uh, rock yeah. and roll night. So party, party every day, man. Oh my gosh, I can't believe Robin Robin Zander. I think that's his okay. name. I won't get him though. So I, I did not want to turn it over and look. <laughs> I got to think of his name. Drive me crazy. So he was interesting because he was this really nerdy looking guy. And he'd always play those crazy guitars. Crazy, that's what I remember. Like, like I think he had one that had six necks or something. It just must have weighed 100 pounds. And I think, wasn't it like a, he had one that was like a big double neck with his each of his legs. Something yeah, like, it, was, it was nuts. He's always had some quirky stuff. That's but he's what kind I of remember a showman. about him. Yep. It, it, anyway, so the, I, but this album, I, I only owned probably mm, four different Cheap Trick albums, maybe five. This one of all the ones I owned was by far my favorite. I loved, I, I think I love every song on this album. It was so good. So anyway, so you've, you've got them looking in mirrors right here. And let's flip it over. And you can see them kind of the part two of this, sure. you know, looking in the mirrors again at each other. But this, so let's look at what's on here. This is this song. Well, let's start with I, I, uh, I want you. Great song. One on one. Great song. If you want my love, you got it. Remember that tune? I that do. one actually became a semi-hit. I don't remember how Ooh La La went. 
looking out for number one. I couldn't tell you how they went, but I loved these. I loved these songs. She's tight. That was just a that's a good great song. Great tune. And interestingly, what year they when I heard this, it has a, a similar thing that they do in Livewire on Too Fast for Love. You know how I go dun 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 they would do something similar in She's Tight where they'd have these pauses and you'd hear these little noises in between. Yeah. And I, I always thought that was an interesting similarity. This all, though, came out a couple years later. Time is running. Saturday at midnight. That was a great tune. Love's Got a Hold on Me. I Want Be Man was a weird song and four-letter word. I don't remember how that one went. But all I know, all I remember about this is I loved all of it. And, and it wasn't, I don't know, as far as covers go, they had these, once again, they had these two relatively good looking guys. I mean, Robin Zander was a really good looking dude. And then the two musician, nerdy, weird looking guys. And then that was the band. And Rick Nielsen was the, was the like I said, the guy that, that yeah, the put driving all this stuff force, together. The, the driving force. The creative force. side, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, Cheap Trick for me was a band that came out or was around, obviously, you know, the live song. Uh, I want you to want me, you know. Then I want you to want me. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, that was the live thing. That was the live thing. I remember that. Um, but then they had like uh, reach out on the heavy metal album. Um, I they had a song on heavy metal. Yeah, I s- kind of remember that. Um, yeah, I, my my cousin Alex, his band did a cover of that, and it was totally awesome. Um, and uh, wow, yeah, it's a heavier version. It was really cool, but it made me kind of go back and be like, "Really, cheap trick on heavy metal?" So I went back, listened to that, and I'm like, "Oh man, yeah, that's right." Do, do, do. And it had like a weird kind of keyboardy intro because uh, I think the singer uh, he played the keyboards and guitar as well. Hmm. Um, I'm trying to think, but then they had like more like in the '80s, they had a couple ballads that kind of came out. Yeah, um, they had. They did. They had one. I've got the album in the other room, too. They did have one big hit that was a slow song. I, I'm not going to remember it while we're sitting here. If I sat long enough, I would, but I'd have to concentrate. Yeah, but it was so huge. They did. It was, it was one a of those, very, like, very big song. You know, you'd, see, you'd hear it like, oh, it's, uh, this is a slow song, <laughs> you know. Um, and it was one of those, you know, I, I can't remember it off the top of my head. Love. Oh. Hmm. I might think of it in a minute on accident just because it'll be spinning yes. around in there but yes they had a i remember that because it was it was on mtv the flame or something like that. i will be the flame that was it that's the one i was Good. that's it nice work nice work you got it dude like i said earlier i don't know how it comes it just sometimes where are these memories Let's take stored. A look inside oh yeah okay i remember this so so we have the inside the right there which so is pretty cool. Again, I mean, yeah. black and white as opposed to color. And you got, I, I think when bands kind of do this, I personally like it. Uh, again, probably because Kiss did it all the time. It shows the individuals that it's yeah. a unit. It's not just, you know, each person's contributing. So they're getting equal fame in a sense. Um, I get my own picture on the inner sleeve. That's, that's pretty cool. It's interesting because... The, this is one of those bands that actually was able to do that because you had so many bands, especially when you go back to the 80s, where basically all you would see is a bunch of hairspray. You'd know who the singer was, and then there's all these other people. Yeah, with more hairspray. With more hairspray, and just more. And, and actually, in not just the 80s, that was very just common with, with bands. It was interesting, and, and Kiss did this on purpose, and a lot of bands did, because they looked back at the Beatles, sure. and they saw that you had these four guys that went out of their way to have their four independent personalities, and everybody had their favorite Beatle, right. the one that they really liked. And so Kiss wanted to do that. They said, how do we create four independent characters? And this is, similarly, they were able to do the same thing here. There's no mistaking any of these people for each other. I right. mean, the, these two guys, a matter of fact, so much so they almost don't look like they would be in the same band. But but when you listen to the music, you get it because their music was a little bit whimsical and it was fun, party kind of crazy yeah, I don't music. Think they, and I think one of the things I mean, even with the name Cheap Trick, like I don't think they're maybe tongue in cheek. They took themselves like we're not. We don't take ourselves that seriously. Yeah. You know, obviously Rick's guitars and things like that kind of 
showcase a little bit of that but yet they are awesome musicians mm-hmm. and they've had amazing songs that still play on your classic rock stage yeah. station right yeah yeah interestingly i remember when i was a kid and they would come to, through town they never played any place big they were always in the 2000 seat venues or so mm. they were never in the at least in denver they were never in the 17 18 thousand but you know they'd come through and i had friends who would always go see them but they were never in the big places and then here's the other side of the inside so let's get the name so bunny carlos that's the one i was saying robin zander got that rick nielsen, rick nielsen. and then I would never, never have got that John Brandt. I've just never known his name. So, but he was the bass player. Right. If anybody knows where John Brandt is today. Yeah. Is he still playing yeah, with them? Yeah, that's interesting. Like, Let's see if there's anything on there that... That's kind of a nice, like, where are you now? In, now, this is interesting. George Marino. Yeah, I, yeah, that's funny because I wouldn't know. These guys, as I recall, and I almost said this, but I wasn't sure, were from, were from Chicago. And this says that this was... Recorded at Pierce Air Recording, Evanston, Illinois. I'm pretty sure they were from Chicago. I'm, I'm not 100%, but I'm pretty positive that's where they were from. Although this says Madison, Wisconsin. That may not mean anything, though. Is that like but, a fan club? Yeah. Back when you couldn't just join their Correspondence face? Correspondence and information in Madison, Wisconsin. Where's that? No Instagram Let's hashtags? Yeah, strange. There's no hashtags well, what's, what's on here at that? all. I don't understand. <laughs> so let's see here so as far as the songs once again let's look at this so who wrote these tunes I want you Rick Nielsen Rick Nielsen Rick Nielsen ooh la la Rick Nielsen Robin Zander Rick Nielsen Rick Nielsen Rick Nielsen and Rick Nielsen Zander Nielsen Zander Rick Nielsen actually one of them Love's Got a Hold on Me Bunny Carlos helped with and then the last one Rick Nielsen Robin Zander so yeah like I said Rick Nielsen was the was the guy that, that put this band together he was the the genius or uh, brains behind this whole thing and then here's the actual album looking if there's anything else interesting on here because you never know sometimes like I said last time you'll find these it's it's hard to see I don't know if this camera can even see them but you can see sometimes these little etchings yeah they always have etchings in them but sometimes you can tell that somebody was being silly and they'd etch something weird in there anyway but this one there's nothing super unusual typical epic epic label and yeah, nothing more to it than that. No, I'm pretty straightforward. Same forward. thing on both sides there. Cheap Trick, one-on-one. Anyway, I loved... I, I still break this one out every once in a while. It, it's These tunes, <clears throat> one-on-one was such a great song. She's Tight was such a great song. They had a bunch of tunes on here that were absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I'm going to have to revisit... So, I loved this some one. Some of those tunes, because it's been a while. I, You know, self-admitted... Self-admittedly? Is that that I say that right? <laughs> um... I haven't listened to a lot of Cheap Trick in a while again. So, yeah, it's good stuff. The, uh, for correspondence, please contact <laughs> P.O. Box. When do you see that? You ever join a, a fan club or anything like Never. that over the years? I don't think I ever did. Okay. I think I sent in on a box of Wheaties for a pair of Puma shoes once, and that was the most I ever they did. They show up? They did. Huh? And they were horrible. <laughs> they were like running on cement. They were these hard, they were terrible shoes, but. Anyway, that's the th- I don't think I ever did anything with a band, though. So, all right, cool. All right, Cheap Trick. Cheap Trick, one-on-one. Nice pick, Dylan. Let's Good get one. another. Got a, Dylan, you got another record for us here? Come grab this one, and we'll get to have him grab another one. And Oh, my gosh. Oh. Okay, this one's fun. This one's... This is a good one. You know, okay, this is, this is, a, this is a good one. This is a big deal. This British Steel, Judas Priest, this one was the one that really, really pushed him over the edge. Yeah, no, and it was a big one. So it's interesting because, okay, when they were originally doing the concept visual for this album, I remember when I got this, and I was looking at the picture, and I was trying, because this, of course, is a razor blade. Right. And I was trying to figure out what was going on with the fingers. Is the blade digging into the fingers, or is the blade not digging into the fingers? So much to look at. So, I know, I sat here staring at it for that reason. (laughs) What is going on here? Well, here's the answer to the question. The blade is digging into the fingers, but it's heavy metal and there's no bleeding. Ah. And and so, and the only reason I even know this. How do you know that? Is because I was, I, I, I listen, 
so I listen to a lot of audiobooks like when I run. Okay. And I was listening to Rob Halford's book Confession. Okay. And he read he it's actually it's a pretty interesting book. It's mostly about Rob Halford growing up and his homosexuality okay. and dealing with it as a kid and then dealing with it as an adult and hiding it. So it's interesting listening to that element of his life because growing up, I didn't know. Yeah, and I don't I, know that I would have ever cared. I just didn't know. I don't think anybody then, knew. Come on, he's a front man. Of a big heavy metal a big band. Heavy and that was actually band. a thing for him because he knew that. And he was so afraid to let anybody know because he figured, because he, here he is, the front man of like the biggest metal band in the world. And he was afraid that it would destroy the band. And so he just, he felt like he had to keep it covered up. Yeah. Crazy, and, crazy things, you know. I mean, and that's what, 20, 30 years ago? Yeah. Maybe yeah. a little bit more. I mean, 2021. Well, you listen to the interviews of like K.K. Downing talking about that now. Sure. And, and And they didn't even talk about it in the band. But it, it, you almost get the impression that K.K. and everybody kind of knew. And they, and they didn't. I think looking even, back, you go. Yeah, yeah, I guess I kind of see it, right. you know, some, some of the way but, he acted dude, and certain things. Like he was, and he actually, when you say yeah, you really do because when you read his book, you see that he was in some ways outwardly trying to show it to grab attention from certain people. I'm sure because he had to hide it, and so anyway. But I, I but anyway, I love. I, 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 he's he's just awesome. I mean, he's no, such a I great singer, great Rob singer. Halford. But as I'm listening to the book. He's talking about this, I think it was that book. He was talking about this album cover, and it was that discussion. They wanted the thing digging into the fingers, but they, and I think a, an original one was that they had the blood, and they're like, nah. A little too much, a little too it's much. It's digging into the fingers, and and, and we're, we're, we don't bleed. We leave that you know? for Iron Maiden with the blood yeah. and the things, like we talked about that one <laughs> and episode. Motley Crue and Motley Yeah. But one, I look at this, and a couple things. Number one is the imagery of they're holding a razor blade, right? Um, that's kind of a thing. Uh, I think back in high school, you remember like people would paint album covers on the back of like their denim jackets. Do you remember that? Did yeah, they do yeah. that? And, yeah. All right. So there was a, a guy and a man, forgive him for, for not remembering his name, but he had this painted on his Levi's jacket. And I was like, what is that? <laughs> And then I guys are like, you know, playing the album or showing, you know, and then you're I was like, okay, you know, this is serious stuff. And then you listen to it and you're like, this is serious stuff. So um, awesome album. But yeah, I mean, that's a, my first recollection when I see this is the he's my buddy's, you know, Levi's painted Levi's jacket. Do you have one of those? Did I have a painted Levi jacket? Yeah. No. No, I didn't either. I was not nearly cool enough for no. that. No. No. This al but this album really was the one that put them firmly on the heavy metal map. Uh, it, I mean, it was a big, big deal for them. And they had several hits on here. And it was... Uh, but, but for me personally, this was not my favorite. It was okay. I liked a lot of songs on here. But it wasn't until they got to Screaming for Vengeance when I became... This is my band. I at Scream for Vengeance, I was I was in 100%. That album is one of my all-time favorite albums ever ever. It just it is non-stop excellent music. And Rob Halford one of the you know what Rob Halford I I thought and think he's one of the greatest front men that's ever and it's weird because he, he was the short hair dude yeah. that didn't look like he should be in a heavy metal band when he's surrounded by all these hair you know hairspray right. and then you get this guy and I remember I saw them on the Defenders of the Faith tour that was the first time I'd ever seen them and Rob Halford he's not a he dance a little bit but he mostly walks around and right. he'd do these weird things with his hands and stuff and I remember I remember walking out of this and it was one of the first times I felt like with a heavy metal band that I had just met someone classy. Isn't that a mm. weird thing? Yes. But I thought that. I thought this guy's not cursing at me all night. You know, I was sensitive very sensitive to it as a kid, of course, you know, right. I was a, I was 13 or something when I saw him. But he wasn't cursing all night. I'm sure he did a little bit, but I just didn't it, it was it was more like everything just felt solid. 
and I loved it. I loved him. I loved his command of the audience. I loved the fact that it was all kind of downplayed. It wasn't him just running around and being crazy like a lot of these other people. It was kind of like, I'm in charge. You know, and he had that he had that confidence about him, the way he moved and the way he'd move his hands and the way he'd Oh my gosh! I love from that moment. I Rob Halford. That is the guy. I love this dude. No, I think so. He was so great. I, I that's a great point. His stage presence was very different than everybody else. Um, just the way he commanded, the way he'd roll out on his Harley. Right. That was yes. kind of one of those things. Hell bent for leather. Um, yep. And it's just it was different, and so that stands out. That kind of is an impressionable thing you know 13 years old going to judas priest what are you doing man i mean <laughs> uh but uh yeah would it that I mean, wouldn't have been or maybe i was 14 it was somewhere right yeah, in we, there. we were young yeah. but that's what you did you went to concerts yeah. and judas priest um i i liked just the heaviness of their songs the double guitar attack again you know kiss had paul and ace playing um but the British Invasion stuff, like we covered Iron Maiden uh, a couple episodes ago. Judas Priest was in that vein of just in your face, rock, steady, and double guitars, and just a over the top awesome singer. Uh, yeah, you. Hard and to beat. He is still awesome. At seven years old, he's still awesome. Yeah, his voice is. He's one of those people that he nails it in the studio. He nails it live. He's got that wherever he is he's just he's just great now this is an interesting picture because it's one of the few times you see him kind of with his moppy with the hair, hair yeah so he had it early on in when they put out Rockerola, which was their first album and he was a he had that long hair and this is where you really start seeing the the stud leather kind of thing coming out in their clothing because if you saw them in earlier albums uh, this is and it, maybe it was it happened even before this album, but you can really see it clearly here because when you first see them on Rock Arola, their first album, I mean, KK Downing's got this fedora ha- kind of hat on, and and these uh, you, they just did not look right. They didn't look like a band. They did not look like this, right? And then you know he ended up. It, of course, Rob Halford got to the point that he just now he's just totally bald, shaved all sure. his head off, hair off. When uh, when Defenders of Faith came out. That was a, he kind of had a little bit of a mullet going, but but he was mostly. This was very an un, a very unusual picture for him, and so and and this band in this lineup stayed around for a while. He ended up leaving a few albums later. Dave Holland is the drummer. Mm-hmm. I don't remember when he joined. I don't think he was the original drummer though. But he was in there for quite a while. And then I think by the time they got to that really kind of speed metal heavy album back in the late 80s, uh, something, I can't think of the name of it, then he was a new drummer that came in. But anyway, getting back to your point, this double guitar attack. Now, one thing I did not know, these guys did not get along very well. No, They apparently did did not really Uh, like each other. I I don't know. I remember reading or hearing or something. I do remember seeing something like that. I didn't see... Uh, Judas Priest uh, there's one of the, my bands that I wanted to see for a long time and obviously for a while there Rob Halford uh, left the band and I got mm-hmm. to see that one guy that won like some yeah he was called the Ripper yeah the Ripper yeah, exa- exactly Tim um, Tim Owens the Ripper yeah. Tim the Ripper Owens and they actually made that movie about him yes uh, Rock, was it called Rockstar is that what it's called yeah, I think so yeah 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 Rockstar with uh Mark Wahlberg. Mark Wahlberg. Oh, that's an Mark awesome Mark. movie. It's a it's a fun. That and movie Jennifer is so Aniston. much fun. That's a great movie. If you I haven't love seen it show. and you love rock and roll, that is it's super fun. And, and it's an about awesome movie. it's it's based on the whole Judas Priest idea. Um, what, what happened with so Tim. I saw at least that's what yeah. It was. So I saw them with that, and it was like the same same dudes. Um, just the singer was different, and uh, but they were awesome. They were so awesome. Um, yeah, this guy just kind of hangs out in the back. I think Ian, every video. Ian Hill. Now, he, as I recall, Ian Hill's married to Rob Halford's sister. I, I think that's why. how they ended up being, knowing each other was something like that. So, and Ian's always, he's still in the band. These are the only two guys still in the band. Unfortunately, now, Glenn has, uh, uh, what's it? Oh, God, I can't think of what it's called. Oh, my God. You start shaking. Oh, 
We're uh, we know music. I, I don't so know. <laughs> right I don't now, know medical stuff. Anyway, he's he's what? seriously. What's that? Parkinson's. Parkinson's. Thank I think you, he has Dylan. Parkinson's. So I would keep him around. <laughs> So I think he's suffering from Parkinson's. KK left the band a while ago. Now yeah, he has a band a called KK's Priest. Oh. It's actually kind of cool. And he, and he got Tim Owens. I think it's Tim Owens singing for him. It's actually pretty cool music. I listened to some of it. It's crazy. There was some weird fallout, though, that they've never been really clear about. But I mean, think, think about the years. I mean, we're talking, they're still kind of going. I mean, Yeah, because he, so he still actually owns part of the band, even though he's not in it somehow. I mean, I think it, we but, touched on that with Aerosmith. It, you know, we covered them and uh, Toys in the Attic is some of these bands have been around forever and still together. I mean, there's very few bands that still, I mean, you mentioned these two guys not getting along. Crap. I mean, <laughs> how can you have like a, a five piece marriage and everybody expect to be on the same and, page and forever? And I've told people That's it's almost crazy. <laughs> I've told people it's even worse than a marriage because what's happening is because we both have been in bands. I mean, I spent part of my life, life as a professional musician. When you're an arty, artsy, creative person, you have a hard time getting around, along with other artsy, creative people just to begin with. There's something about it that your personality sometimes doesn't play well with others. Sure. So you take a bunch of artists, throw them in a room together, tell them to be a cohesive unit, and then stay cohesive for 30 years. And and you just, it's it, you're going to have disasters. You're going to have drug abuse. You're going to have, I mean, maybe and that's, that's why. what happens. That's, maybe that's why. Yeah. They, they just so can't get along. It just It's never going to work. Good. It's never going to work. So when you have people like that that stick around as long as they do, it's kind of a miracle. The songs on here, of course, break in the law was huge huge hit i mean it's still i that's still a staple for them metal gods actually that's where halford ended up kind of getting that term where he is called the metal mm -hmm. god uh let's see you're living after midnight was a, another, was a, another really big hit and uh, you know honestly united was actually kind of a big song too i i, I couldn't speak intelligently about these other songs because i like i said i listened this a few times and i'm i'm would be hated in the judas priest world for saying this but i didn't love the album but this was the turning point and interesting about this album the next album i think the next one was point of entry which was really lazy <clears throat> the album cover was kind of lazy the like music was kind of lazy yes and they knew they did laurels? too and they knew they did and and it was the one after that screaming for vengeance when they, yeah. they, they they like they hit it with this album it's like we're there and then they then they kind of yawned with right. their next album and, they got and then they realized down. yeah they realized we, yeah, we were we kind of screwing up and then they just kicked it and screaming for vengeance of course and that one has you got another yeah. thing coming and that one was the you know that one of course put them on the map with you know popular yeah. music and i do everything. like before we turn it over i do like how the razor blade is cutting. oh yeah um i think that's really kind of that cool. is pretty cool that's yeah, yeah and then they have that iconic logo that i don't remember what album that showed up but it was two or three it was i think the third album before they got the logo because if you go back and look at i think sad wings of destiny i think that was their second one they still had that script looking thing mm -hmm. and i think it was it was somewhere right after that that they got this and then they've kind of stuck with that logo that, that, that iconic thing ever since. Then this kind of a typical, nothing special on the inside, typical Columbia, Columbia Records uh, inside here. Forward, yeah. And then all the stuff, Glenn Tipton, Rob Halford, K.K. Downing. Yeah, that's, uh, that's who wrote all the songs. So, and it's interesting, because all of us that were music fans thought it called him K.K., because he's K.K. Downing. Right. And Does it stand for something? I wouldn't know. Well, his name's Ken. And when you listen to you listen to Rob Halford's book, he calls him Ken through the whole thing, and it was just weird. You know, because since I'm a kid, he's KK. Yeah, KK. And, and he's Ken, 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 Ken. And they apparently, they did not call each other Ken or KK. It was, or uh, KK, they called, called him Ken. I mean, imagine but, these guys, I mean, like you said, they're in their 60s, 70s now. Yeah, I think they're in, these guys I mean, are in their 70s at this point. They met when they were in their 20s or teens and maybe yeah. you know it's, it, yeah. you're gonna go by you know the the name you remember K Ken my <laughs> stage name's KK <laughs> call me KK call me KK I've often thought about that when these guys come up with these names how it would be so hard to, to call them some weird name after they've made it up but people do it you know they have stage names and it's 
but which is anyway. That's that's a this good is a great album. That's a good suggestion to comment on. Is anybody you know that has funny stage names as opposed to their real name kind of thing, right? This would be you know, KK. Yeah. Right? I mean, isn't the uh, I mean isn't the uh, Ace Frehley's real name is Paul, Paul, but Paul Stanley you had, so they change it up or whatever. Yeah, and, he said, and I think that somebody in in high school used to call him Ace or something, and so then that ended up sticking. And and it, Kiss actually Kiss is filled with that. None of those guys. Peter Chris is not his name. Ace Frehley's not his name. Paul huh. Stanley's not his name. Gene Simmons is not his name. None of them. Yep. None of them. Marketing. Not even close. <laughs> Matter of fact, Gene Simmons, that's not even close to his name. He, he went through several names changed from this to this to this and then ended up at gene simmons so yeah that's pretty common so yeah no it's it's all right this is a good one good, this is a great good pick, good, pick. good pick dylan nice work all right let's get another one in here oh man i know what this is i saw the back and i thought i know what that one is this one is cool okay talk about album cover that's menacing yeah i mean dio, so dio the last in line now this was Dio's second solo album. The and first one was Holy one, Diver. Holy Diver with Rainbow in the Dark and all that, right? Rainbow in the Dark. So Vivian and Campbell's playing guitar. Vivian Campbell, yep, was on that first Dio album. As a matter of fact, you know, Ronnie James Dio discovered Vivian Campbell, who sure. now plays for Def Leppard. Yeah, forever. Which is I don't yes. get it. But I don't know. I've never been able own? to I've seen him with Def Leppard and, and I, I for me this is always him. This this kind of style, the heavier music. stuff. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, Vivian Campbell. You, you, he was so cool. He was so good. Yes. I, I believe, if I if I'm not mistaken, he's on this as well. Yeah. Yeah. So for sure. Now this is interesting because one of the things that Ronnie James Dio was clearly trying to do was create a character, because this same character is on Holy Diver, and this same character is on the one after this, which was was Dream Evil after this. Anyway, he he put out a bunch more albums, and for me, they just kind of became one big yeah. album. They just all, for me, I was a huge Dio fan, but after this one, they all just started re- rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. They started sounding all the same Yeah, I think he kind of stuck to that formula, but it yeah. didn't have, like, I mean, nothing against this. There's some great tunes on this one, but Rainbow in the Dark. Dude, yeah, that's that hard first to beat, album, bro. The first album was just amazing this album followed almost the exact formula and this was a great album too not as good but great and uh, but st- not as great or whatever anyway this was still really really good album but then it started falling off a little bit after this but still he here's this character that was on the first one and he's also got that you know that thing yeah. and there's the always that dispute who came up with that was it him or gene simmons right. you know because gene simmons matter of fact i remember seeing an interview with with Ronnie James Dio, and he was talking. Somebody asked him about that. Said, "Now Gene Simmons actually claims that he came up with that look." And and Ronnie James Dio said something like, "Well, Gene Simmons, of course, he invented that, and he invented water, and you know, and he right, yeah, was I making actually, fun I about Gene. Seeing that. <laughs> Gene says he did everything, <laughs> and so anyway. But this was always, if you ever see all that old Ronnie James Dio stuff, he's got that right. thing that he's doing all the time, and." Anyway, that's his. So you've got the the big character. I think he had a name for this character too. I don't remember what it was. Yeah, not as strong as characters like Eddie. No, and that's the thing. He was trying to create an Eddie kind of thing to right. represent this band, which was Dio. Even though that's his name, that was the band name, mm-hmm. Dio. And then there was always this thing about if you turn Dio upside down, it says devil, you know. And that was the. I'll show you. People used to show me this. That there's the D, there's the E, there's the V, and there's the L. So that was the okay for the, the point. people with more imagination than me or time. Yeah, yeah. That you're, but that looking, was the thing, though. But that was the you thing. Were into that, that stuff, like, dude, it says devil, man. He's like a. I mean, look at that. That that Satan right yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you yeah. know, again, we touched on this. I think once again before. It, it's one of those things that the imagery. You couldn't just Google this. This mm-hmm. is something you'd go to a store. You're looking through this. And as an 18-year-old or 20-year-old, and you're like, what's cool? What's heavy? Now, by this time, heavy metal's rocking. Yeah, because what year was this? 84, 83, something like that. And, I mean, you're going to pick something out that's menacing, right? That's Oh, yeah. Heck, yeah. So, here you go. 84. 
marketing at its finest. Yes, yeah, exactly. And and of course Dio Dio was just he was such a great as a matter of fact, I was I, I bust out stuff and listen to him every once in a while because some of his some of his lyrics would would border on the silly because it would just kind of go into the same kind of topics all the time. I mean, at some point in this album, he's going to talk about a rainbow. He's going to talk about, you know, it's some medieval thing, you know, the knights and knight and warrior, you know, whatever, princess. I mean, that you, it's that kind of imagery yeah. that conjures up everything Dio really. That's what, you, that's at least for me. But, but still, his voice was so, there's never been anybody like him. I mean, to me, the closest is probably maybe Bruce Dickinson from Iron Maiden as far as that huge thing. Yeah. But it, it was so big. And as a matter of fact, prior to this band, prior to Dio, of course, he was with Black Sabbath. Sure. And I mean, replacing Ozzy. Replacing That's Ozzy. That's a big deal. Yes. And now you're going to go out and form your own band. And uh, you mentioned uh, Dickinson as being the other guy with a big voice. Both of them, we touched on how... He wasn't a very big guy. Maybe there's Dio's not a very no, big guy. No, he's actually the same thing. Um, really, really short. Little, to get little short guy, guy and huge voice. Yeah. Um, not, not, you know, not saying anything bad about little guys, but huge <laughs> voices. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, see, he was, he was not. As a matter of fact, I had a, a good friend back in Denver, Doug, that had that's met Dio a few times, and and Doug's like six three, and Dio was he was really, really a small guy. But giant voice, and apparently just one of the most pleasant, unassuming people you'd ever meet. Like a really, that's, really nice guy. That's exactly what I've heard, Robert, is Dio's one of the nicest people. He's all menacing with the marketing and all this, but one of the nicest people. Yeah. Had like some like L.A. bowling league or something. Hmm. I don't know. I've, I don't know where or how I know that. Correct me if I'm wrong, anybody. But, uh, you know, super nice. That's yeah. I've, I've heard that. Uh, I think, um, oh my gosh, I'm thinking about the guy that has the radio talk show all the time. He's interviewed him. He mentioned something like that once before, too. Oh, um, uh, I know who you're talking about. I'll think of it in a minute. Because he, he, I listen to him all the time because he always talks to the heavy metal. Dude, oh, God, I feel silly. I can't think of his name because he's the one that did that metal show. Yes, that's one yeah. thing. Eddie Trunk. Eddie Trunk. I love Eddie Trunk. So... So Dio, super nice guy, humongous voice, but you know, to, to end up being a solo artist, he of course his first band I think was called Elf, and then Richie Blackmore when he left uh, when he left Deep Purple, formed a band called Rainbow. Ryan James Dio right. was the first singer for Rainbow, and that's well, where Man like on the Silver about, Mountain. Yeah, if you like singing about rainbows. I yes, exactly. But perfect. but that gives you the thing like Man on the Silver Mountain. It's this kind of this imagery, medieval mm -hmm. imagery that was always his thing. Then, of course, he joins Black Sabbath, does two albums, Heaven and Hell, Mob Rules, actually three if you count the Live Evil. And then there was some problems with Live Evil that, that got him and he got upset about how things were mixed and whatever. And it was a little bit of a challenge coming in and replacing Ozzy. Oh, my gosh, that's a kind of a weird story. But, but think about that. Ronnie James, because this is kind of what forced him out to become his own band. Yeah. He was in Black Sabbath. They put out Heaven and Hell, uh, mob rules. He's replacing Ozzy for heaven's right. sake. I mean, how do you do that? It's like replacing Robert Plant and Led Zeppelin. I mean, similar kind of idea. Yeah, huge shoes to fill. So, and, and very, very tough for people to accept it. They then, then look at the timing. They put out these two albums with Dio. Then they put out a live album called Live Evil. And then at the same time, Ozzy Osbourne has put out two albums and puts out a live album called Speak of the Devil. Guess which one sells? <laughs> the Ozzy album. And it's a bunch it's of Black Aussie. Sabbath covers. Right. With Brad Gillis from Night Ranger playing guitar on it. Right. So basically Black Sabbath puts out a song with Ronnie or album with Ronnie James Dio live and then Ozzy Osbourne puts out a live album with Black Sabbath cover tunes. And and you know, I think all this stuff then, uh, then you know, Dio in the middle of it's upset about how it's being mixed, and he thinks that Tony Iommi's being deceptive and stuff. And so then they part ways. Yeah. Dio goes, forms the uh, band, finds Vivian Ca Campbell, creates that first album with Rainbow in the Dark, which is huge, huge. And then he, of course, thinks that he invented uh, 
keyboard riffs in heavy metal. I don't know, but he, you know, he's talked about that. I was the you know, in, in Rainbow in the Dark. He's pretty proud of that. And then anyway, so then and then this is the the follow up album. So flipping it over, it's kind of part two of the front. You know, you've got more of the people and just the the destruction here. And then so uh, produced by Dio. Then we'll know for the first time if we're evil or divine, we're the last in line. This is actually yeah, taken lyric, from right? the, song. the song, The Last in Line. We Rock, he followed the same pattern from the first album. The first album had a song called, uh, oh God, I can't remember it, but it, it, the first album starts out with this really heavy rock and tune, and then it's followed by Holy Diver, same thing here, followed by the song that, and then somewhere in here, there's actually even a song that has a keyboard because he invented uh, the keyboard, he did, heavy he did the metal one in heavy riff. metal. I can't which one. It was. I think it's mis- it's mystery. So on side two, where Rainbow in the Dark was on side two in the first album with the keyboard, mystery side oh, two I'm impressed, keyboard, man. same pattern. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I can't think of the first song. I'm going to feel so stupid in ten minutes when it crossed my mind what the first song on the first album was, because it was such a great, great. I mean, such a great tune. Anyway, I'll just I'll let that one go because I'm going to feel. But anyway. So then he has this thing, those who created, those who labored, those who supported. So I guess oh, that's, that's his way cool. of saying who did. So he's got Ronnie James Dio Viv- uh, singing uh, vocals, keyboards. Vinny Appice was the drums. Yeah. Jimmy Bain on bass. Uh, Vinny Appice actually, I believe, had played, in, played on those Black Sabbath albums too. And I think yeah, there's even, they even misspelled so. his name on one of them, as I recall. But anyway... I think that's where he got him. Vivian Cabell guitar, and yeah, which then we talked about him. Claude He's just awesome. Shoal, Shell or whatever Shoal on keyboards. And I remember hit that guy too. Apparently, he's really talented guy. Good thing Ronnie showed him how to get it done. Better believe it. <laughs> yep. So, and I want to see if I know any of these other names here. Oh, then you've got the people that drew it, and uh, oh, the and, artists. Uh, Give some props. Good job, Ronnie. Let's see, so Barry Jackson. Uh, original concept Ronnie and Wendy Dio they're the ones that came up with this idea Wendy was his he was stayed married to her till the day he died because yeah. Ronnie of course passed away yes. a few years ago from some sort of uh, stomach cancer yeah. and Wendy has kind of carried on his legacy and she's kind of an interesting character too but they yeah, apparently really done... loved each other yeah no so, I think uh, rest in peace Ronnie but I think they're doing some like hologram oh, tour yes. yeah, I think we were talking about that a while back crazy yeah, interesting that's interesting right yeah. like the live band with Dio as the hologram yeah. I always liked the inside of this I remember I just stared at this thing forever just this picture you know it just the fans it, some group I must be out sort of some concert I suppose I remember just looking at this and staring at all these people and then of course that's cool people would bring their artwork in and um then on this side, you've got the different guys in the band, just little shots of them kind of in action. Nice. So there's Vivian. He was a nobody. You know, Ronnie discovered him. He's very proud of that fact, too. And there's Dio. And, and the rest of the, the, band the, band the rest of the band down there. And let's just take a quick look on the inside, see if there's anything here. I know this is just kind of standard a typical Warner Brothers. standard Warner Brothers, except he used his, had the little, kind of put his logo there. And then... Uh, we rock RJ Dio, RJ Dio, Viv- uh, Bane Campbell. So Dio looks like he was involved in she writing. Has some writing credits, yeah. You know, interestingly, and I don't want to, be- I-, I could go on for a while about this, but interestingly, one of the things that Ronnie James Dio did that was kind of interesting that he learned from, this is actually really interesting, and I, could, I-, I don't want to go off on this forever, but when he was in Rainbow, one of the things that he didn't like about being in Rainbow was that uh, Richie Blackmore. That was his band. Right. Richie Blackmore, of course, is the guitarist for Deep Purple and can do no wrong. Yeah. He's the guy. He's the man in charge. And he made sure everybody knew that he was the man in charge. And so there wasn't a lot of collaboration in that band. And so when Dio put this band together, he went out of his way to make sure that the band members were involved in the songwriting and the cr- creative process. Because he's a nice guy. We which, talked about that. It's yeah. a nice guy, and it's also real leadership. You, you know, you realize that if you're, a, if you're a good leader, you succeed if the people that work for you feel, yeah, have an think, investment um, in it. 
Yeah, I think that people say that you can stand up and shout. That's the first song on the other album. Oh, Sorry, I had to get that. So okay, that <laughs> was killing me. Okay, uh, go ahead. I was gonna say, yeah, you have the power over type leadership or yeah. power with. I can see being powered over by Reggie Blackmore. I can see uh, Dio being the power with. Hey, let's all feel, you know, you're contributing. This is even though the band's got my name and I'm the front man. I mean, for him to be collaborative and having everybody be part of that. I mean, yeah, that's going to be, it's going to have that cohesiveness. Although he did have quite the turnstile of people coming through his band over the years. Yeah, over time he did. I mean, uh, Craig Goldie came in after, I think he was right after Vivian Campbell. And he was a kind of a guitar whiz god too. He played with Jufria and yeah. And then he just had that kind of thing. Same thing. Yeah. So, and it, but it was always Dio at the heart of it. Yeah. And then Dio got back together with with the original guys from Black Sabbath and did Heaven and Hell not long before he died. And if you want to hear a great vocal performance, get on YouTube. Find Heaven and Hell doing the song Mob Rules. And I think it's in New York and it's a daytime performance. Find this performance. You will rarely in your life hear a more ear-splitting vocal line in a good way than Ronnie James Dio does in that. And he's gotta be 70 in this take, or late 60s in this. And yeah. he's as good, if not better, than he was when he was younger. It's one of the greatest things you'll ever hear if you like heavy metal. Find that recording, that live performance, and it'll blow your mind how great Dio is. No, I'll have to check that out. I don't so, think I've seen that. Yeah, it was great. A good deal, All man. Right, man. Three good choices. That was, those are great albums. Anyway, that was super fun. Yeah, going through that good. stuff so audiomover.com thanks for joining us be sure to like this video subscribe leave comments we'd love to hear what you have to say about this and there you go thanks Robert this All is right. awesome you bet. Bye.